know, I think everybody wants to know where great artists come up with ideas for their creations. You can learn technique, but you can't learn art. You can't teach art. His work is stunningly beautiful, stunningly ugly, stunningly tacky, stunningly sophisticated. It's all of it. And that's what makes a great artist. Paul Evans lived, worked, and created in Bucks County. He was also a world-class sculptor and furniture maker. And we are delighted to bring the story of Paul Evans to a greater world. I opened up a showroom in New Hope in 1951. And Paul probably was 17, 18. And he wanted to put some of his work in my showroom. And I said, sure. I put in some big bronze urns that Paul made. He had started as a silversmith. And he viewed himself very much as a artist working in metal. His stuff is, was absolutely beautiful. In 1956, Paul Evans began a collaboration with Philip Lloyd Powell that would last a decade. Phil Powell was a wonderful family friend. He was definitely a, a major influence. They were as close as two brothers. Paul, how you doing, George? All right, let's go get a sandwich or whatever. But Phil was a really temperamental artist. He was like that uh, guy that cut his ear off because somebody didn't like his painting. Van Gogh, you know, it was like night and day. Paul say, Bobby, take that chest out of there. Phil say, put it back. Paul say, take it out, throw it in the car. They worked like that. They'd be mad at each other all the time. They did some beautiful work together. Make you cry. First things we made together were probably the grill's sort of fish scale pattern that I used on doors. And then he did them as a screen and started doing furniture. It's all one aesthetic, but you can enjoy different styles of Paul Evans' studio work. So you have the perforated, you have the wavy, the verdigris, the Argenta series. With the Argente furniture, he was really trying to get the look of silver in the aluminum. He would take an acetylene torch and just move it over the surface, and the aluminum would pool into these textures. The Argente line, unfortunately, was so toxic and dangerous to produce that they had to discontinue it despite its popularity, and it thus remains one of the most rare of Evans' lines. You can just look at it as a sculpture, and it stands on its own as a sculpture, and then it's functional as well. What I love is that it's futuristic and primitive at the same time. It's really on that edge between beautiful and ugly. I mean, because there is a certain brutality to it. I mean, this furniture is massive, it's heavy, it's masculine, it's tough, but it's also incredibly refined. Paul would see things in very different ways, I think, than a lot of people did. And he was intensely involved in his business. I mean, it was all about design. When I went into Dad's office in the morning, I would see rolls and rolls of onion skin paper with just shapes and sketches and doodles and ideas on them. And as the day progressed, those shapes would turn into a cabinet or they would turn into a door. The line of furniture that's become very well known are called the sculpted steel cabinets. We called them forged front because that was the feature of the product were the forgings. Forging is like a blacksmith would have done. You put it in the forge, you pull it out with a pair of tongs and a hammer, and you physically stand there to do that shape. And anything you wanted. That's anything like this. Yeah, these are all forgings here. These are here, end forgings. Here. These are end forgings on rods. Dorsey ran upstairs. He was a welder. He was the main welder, put everything together. Like a chef washing his own dishes, you know. It just doesn't make sense after a while. So Paul would team it over to Dorsey, then who passed it down to the next one until they got it done. 
Like Andy Warhol and his factory, Evans brought together a really diverse group from the area and allowed them to be really open and experimental under Paul's guidance. Paul would say, see what you can do with that piece. I said, what do you want to look like? Paul said, let's take a ride. That's 100 years ago. <laughs> we rode around the country in the winter time, the fall of the year, seeing these nice fields and stuff like that. He showed me what he wanted, but in nature, from that, I went from there. I came back to the shop and started working on it. I do some colors like you wouldn't believe. I swear it's like a Rembrandt painting. I do gold leaf and silver leaf and antiquing, oxidizing, we need aluminum. Whatever it takes to make the piece nice, the black, the lines, the scrolls, the screen, the scratches. Evans made the piece, but I finished the piece. They only opened the showroom from 8 till 12 on Saturday night because the people with money coming up from Philly or down from New York to see the Bucks County Playhouse. And people would go up there and have dinner and walk down to get their car and they'd pass our showroom. Paul had a great sense of humor. He was so charming, he could sell ice to Eskimos. Most of the time, the customer didn't have a clue what they were gonna get. He sold them an idea on a piece of paper. No, no specifics. No. In fact, all the dimensions on my original order blank said approximate size. Yes. It was, let's get it done, get it out the door so we get paid. If we don't deliver this by Thursday night, you aren't getting paid no on money. Friday. There's no money. <laughs> I mean, door shoot time. I better do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> Hacksaw. We had no machine. Hacksaw. We hacksaw that baby. No, no heat, no money. No heat, no bathroom, no money. And we make a lot of money, but we was happy. And I got a reputation out of it, too. People still know me for that. Directional Furniture was founded in 1950 and was one of the first companies to embrace original furniture design in America. When Evans' relationship with Directional Furniture took off, Phil Powell, who was a self-proclaimed dropout, um, decided that he wanted to be an artist and he didn't want to be in big business. And so they parted ways and remained lifelong friends. We made up a set of samples for Directional Furniture. Back in the corner, we had the round bar they just thought it was a whim, a disc. And then when Paul went over and opened up and showed them it was a door and a full bar inside, they said, I don't care how much it costs, we have to have it. I think Directional bought almost every piece that he presented. And it just took off like hotcakes. We couldn't make it fast enough. Paul had had a huge success, and he was very much the darling of the design world at that point. The ego that developed then just got bigger and bigger. Paul would tell me, say, Bob, you know, that's not smooth enough. What do you mean, Paul? He said, it's not smooth enough. When you get perfect, then you get a plot of gold on it. But it had to be perfect. A lot of sand. In. Hundreds of experiments at the Evans studio led to the most successful techniques for directional furniture. And Evans' relationship with Directional created 800 pieces between 1964 and 1982. It became too congestive to try to build studio pieces and Directional pieces. So uh, we bought a property in Lambertville, had previously been a golf ball factory. I think I was the first woman that was hired. I was very scared when I walked in there because there was mostly men. At the time, they were all gorgeous looking men. <laughs> and then we proceeded to hire maybe 10 to 15 more women. Evans started exploring these highly reflective, shattered surfaces, mirrored surfaces. Each one of us had our own pattern. I can tell what piece is mine, what piece is Hilda's, or what piece was Sharon's. The cityscape line embodied the disco era. It was fractured metal pieces, polished brass, and mirrored chrome. He was really defying traditional craft, constantly experimenting with new materials, borrowing from industrial manufacturing. Paul's genius is the ability to put a finish on anything. So if it's metal over wood, 
it's a finish over another form. Uh, we worked in cardboard for a while. There's a, a small line of cargit furniture and it was wonderful until there was a little bit of moisture and it just melted into the ground. We bought scrap for mica every month, 200 sheets, didn't matter what color, and we covered all the pieces with it so we didn't have all the holes and everything to fill. And then we primed it and lacquered over that. With Paul, everything was bigger. Let's take on more space, we're gonna make more furniture, we're gonna make it bigger, we're gonna make it faster, and, and we're just going to inundate the world with it. We moved to Plumstadville, Everything was built inside a factory. And then by 1975, 76, we were at 80 employees, two shifts. Even when the factory went to 80 people, he made a point of visiting each and every one of those employees every morning before he would start his daily business grind. He'd get his cup of coffee, he'd walk around telling jokes, he would talk to Meech, the guy who swept the floor, and he would talk to Tony Ipri, the factory foreman. He had time for everybody. He poured his heart out to each and every one of us. He became our friend. Paul was one of the nicest people you'd ever meet. If he met somebody and he liked them, he'd hire them, so there was a large payroll. That weighed very heavily on him because he felt personally responsible for each person at the factory. He had the weight of the world on his shoulders trying to pay the bills, trying to come up with a new idea every six months. Uh, he put himself in a tremendously stressful position. Paul Evans worked in a whirlwind of creativity. He produced new lines and new techniques nearly every six months for 20 years. Sales would go up and down with directional. Uh, studio had really kind of taken a back seat. He parted ways with directional simply because what we had wasn't selling anymore. One day he said, we're going to be opening up a showroom in New York. He wanted to get more into interiors. He would gut a person's entire apartment and start from the beginning. We started to get into more architectural design and interior design. It was very contemporary, it was very sleek. In the 80s, he moves into electronic furniture. He was literally one of the first people in design to embrace the electronics. You would push a button and something would turn, you would hit the remote control and something would lift. It was pretty innovative, but people weren't quite understanding that. The showroom in New York opened in probably 1980 and closed in, I believe, 1984. That overhead, the overhead of the factory, the money, vendors, the responsibility of a payroll every Friday, it just literally overwhelmed it. I think in the end there was too much drinking and not enough attention paid to the shop and uh, things just kind of fell. I think that in his own soul he was an artist, yet how do you afford an environment um, to pursue your artwork in? And I think that's where things got cloudy. Does the artist drive the business or does the business drive the artist? It got out of control and, and it just reached a point where we can't do this anymore. His demons towards the end became too great. He had a massive heart attack on Nantucket Island first day after retiring in 1987. He left a legacy as the father of the modern art furniture movement. Paul Evans really showed how furniture could be expressive of art. No two are identical. Everyone was different, and that's what was so unique about it. You know, it was art to us. It was always art to us. Paul Evans furniture looks like it was made in a moment, but today it has this timeless quality. They've become American classics. Paul Evans' work, it's alive. You can feel its energy, it's living. I would equate him to Miles Davis. I would equate him to Jimi Hendrix. His work will stand the, the test of time.